Good morning. morning. Welcome everyone to worship this morning. Uh, I have a few quick announcements before we get started. Uh, Today is meeting Sunday. We will have um, a deacon's meeting following worship, uh, circle following Sunday school, and outreach here at 3 o'clock. Kids group today at 4 p.m. Bible study on Wednesday at 6. This is going to be a little bit different. Um, we have a yard sale that's coming Saturday, so we'll be, instead of having Bible study, having time to kind of help set up, the more hands the better. If you would like to come help, uh, please do. And for those of you that would normally come, uh, I'll know if you're not there because you don't want to work. So please, if, uh, if you're able to come help, uh, please do that. And the yard sale will be this coming weekend. Uh, we can need help with that as well. If you would like to do that, please see me, and I'll let you know more about that. Um, and then uh, the following weekend... Uh, will be the 19th through the 21st. We'll be having our family fellowship weekend. We'll have it at the, here at the church on Friday, ordering pizzas, uh, have a time of games, uh, a movie, uh, just to spend together the church. And then Saturday, we'll be in Clover at Clover Community Park from 11 to 4. Uh, we will be grilling out hamburgers and hot dogs. Um, they've got playgrounds, a splash pad, disc golf, a pond to fish in, some more games we'll have. So uh, feel free to come out to both of those. Just a time for us to get together as a church. And um, two, two more things also, if you'd like to help uh, fix up the playground, before that weekend, uh, please see me after service. Uh, we just need to put a few more boards on there, um, and that should be it. And uh, what, uh, two things that are on here for the yard sale. If you have any plastic bags, like grocery bags you want to get rid of, we will take all that we, we can. Uh, we can we'll use them this Saturday. As well as, if you have any plastic tables at home that we can borrow, uh, we can put a piece of tape with your name on it underneath. Um, that way we'll have plenty of tables to put things on this weekend. So if you have either of those, um, you bring them up to the church. Or if you can't get in, call me and I will make, make it happen. So, But all that to say, uh, we've come to worship, um, not to hear me t- give announcements. So let us now turn our hearts to God as we hear his word, as he calls us to worship from Psalm 96, verses 3 through 6. Hear now God's word. Declare his glory among the nations. His marvelous works among all the peoples. For great is the Lord and greatly to be praised. He is to be feared above all gods. For all all the gods of the peoples are worthless idols. But the Lord made the heavens. Splendor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in his sanctuary. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, we come before you today and we worship you as our mighty God, as our mighty King, as our Savior, as our all in all. And Lord, now as we are here today, Lord, may you help us to focus upon you. Lord, may this be a time that's refreshing, rejuvenating for us, encouraging, equipping, Lord, as we come and we praise you. Lord, as you work in us by your spirit, Lord, open our hearts and our minds today to to worship you and to set aside all distractions. Lord, help us today to grow closer to you as we lift up your name, as we come before you in prayer, and as we hear your word. Lord, may this time be a blessing to us all, and glorifying to you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. But everyone to stand together. Our first hymn this morning is number nine, Now Thank We All Our God.
Let's pray. Our mighty God, we come before you here again today. For you are God that has blessed us with all things in this life. And Lord, now we seek to give a portion of them back to you. Lord, we don't trust in the things of this world, but we trust in you as the God who has given us to them. And so, Lord, we trust as we give back to you that you will continue to take care of us. And so now, Lord, we pray that you would use these tithes, these offerings for you and for your glory. Give us wisdom and how we use them so that you would get the praise. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly host. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Again, we come this morning and we confess the God that we believe in as found in the Apostles' Creed on page 12 of your hymn book. So I ask you this morning, Christians, in whom do you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. Our first scripture lesson is the first part of our entire scripture lesson this morning. We're looking at Daniel chapter 8. Right now, looking at the first 14 verses. Hear now God's word. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me. Daniel, after that, which appeared to me at the first. And I saw in the vision, and when I saw, I was in Susa, the citadel, which is in the province of Elam. And I saw in the vision, and I was at the Uli Canal. I raised my eyes and saw, and behold, a ram standing on the bank of the, car, of the canal. It had two horns, and both horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher one came up last. I saw the ram charging westward and northward and southward. No beast could stand before him, and there was no one who could rescue from his power. He did as he pleased and became great. As I was considering, behold, a male goat came from the west across the face of the whole earth without touching the ground, and the goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes. He came to the ram and the two horns, which I had seen standing on the bank of the canal, and ran at him in his powerful wrath. I saw him come close to the ram, and he was enraged against him, and struck the ram and broke his two horns. And the ram had no power to stand before him, but he cast him down to the ground and trampled on him. 
and there was no one who could rescue the ram from his power. Then the goat became exceedingly great, but when he was strong, the great horn was broken, and instead of it, there came up four conspicuous horns toward the four winds of heaven. Out of one of them came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great towards the south, towards the east, and toward the glorious land. It grew great even to the host of heaven, and some of the host and some of the stars it threw down to the ground and trampled on them. It became great, even as great as the prince of the host, and the regular burnt offering was taken away from him, and the place of his sanctuary was overthrown. And a host will be given over to it together with the regular burnt offering because of transgression, and it will throw truth to the ground, it will act and prosper. Then I heard a holy one speaking, and another one said to the one who spoke, For how long is the vision concerning the regular burnt offering, the transgression that makes desolate, and the giving over of the sanctuary and host to be trampled underfoot? And he said to me, For 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary shall be restored to its rightful state. God's word for God's people. Let's pray together. Our Heavenly Father, again we come before your throne of grace here this morning. We come before you, Lord, knowing that you are a God that we can come to with all manners of things. For you are a God that can do the impossible. And Lord, as we might doubt that in our daily lives, you remind us of that through Christ. For Lord, we are sinners who are broken who've sinned against you. And yet, where we could find no salvation ourselves, you stepped in by sending your Son to come and to take our punishment upon himself on the cross so that we instead would get his righteousness, that we would be delivered, that we would be forgiven and saved. Something that is impossible for us, but that you can do. And Lord, as we have hope in Christ for our salvation, we also have hope that you are a God that can answer our prayers, whatever they might be whether it be a small problem or a big one, you are a God that can do it all. And so, Lord, we come to you here today and we cast our burdens at your feet. Lord, for some of us, those burdens may be financial. You might be struggling to pay our bills. You might be trying to, to keep clothes on our backs and foods on the table. is difficult with the salaries or the, the problems that we're facing. For others of us, it might be sickness and health might be dwindling from cancer, something other life-threatening. It may be dealing with depression or anxiety or grief. Some of us might be coming here today struggling with addiction and our sin and temptation, problems with family members, with people at school, those in our jobs. Lord, we all come here today with something on our hearts. And we are reminded that you are a God that is able to answer them all. Whatever it is that we are going through, Lord, we know we can trust that you are in control. And Lord, we can trust as we give these things to you in prayer that you will indeed answer. Lord, although it might not be in the yes we might want, you still may answer no. But we know it's all for your glory and for our good. And so, Lord, we come and we lay these things at your feet today and know that you are going to take care of us. Whatever may happen today or tomorrow. Lord, we continue to pray for our church. May you continue to bless our church. May you continue to build up our church. Help us to grow closer to you, closer to one another. Strengthen our faith and enable us to continue to be a light to the world around us. Lord, may you use us to share Jesus with others, not only in our words, but also in our actions. Help us to show forth Christ to all of those around us, Lord, that you might work in their heart and bring them to you. Lord, that we might be a witness to all those around us, whether that be in our families, in our jobs, in our schools, and to our neighbors, wherever it might be. Lord, may you help us make an impact for you. And Lord, may you just continue to work in us to build us up closer to you each and every day. For Lord, we, your, this world needs your light, and so Lord, may we be it. May you help us to stop being half-hearted in our faith, but Lord, may we live it out each and every day. Convict us, encourage us to do just that. Instead of just standing on the sidelines and keeping our mouths shut, help us to speak up and to stand proudly for Jesus Christ wherever we might be. For Lord, yes, the world might not like it, but we know that you are greater than the world. You have overcome the world. And so, Lord, help us then to be those that show the conquering Christ, the saving Christ to all those around us. And now, Lord, we come here today with many things upon our hearts, and we take a moment to offer them all to you in silent prayer.
And now, Lord, when we don't know what to pray, we can always pray the prayer you taught your disciples praying. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. given to the church, that by believers and their children, it will be a sign of his covenant to us. And again, it's a sign of the covenant. There's nothing magic in this water, as much as we wish it might be, but it points us to the truth of the gospel. It points us to the salvation of Jesus Christ, that those who would put their trust and faith in him, they would be washed as white as snow, just as this water points us to. And so here this morning, Hunter and Abby Covington bring their son. John Neely here this morning to come to be a part of the sacrament. But before we continue on, there are a few questions that must be asked. But to you, because we are answering the prayer that Jesus has given us. Do you renew the vows that you made when you received the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior and entered into the full communion of this church? Do you acknowledge that your child is a sinner in the need of the cleansing blood of Jesus Christ? Do you claim God's covenant promises on this child's behalf? And do you look in faith to the Lord Jesus Christ for this child's salvation as you do for your own? And do you now covenant and promise in humble reliance on the grace of God to bring up your child to love God and to serve him to the end that your child may come to commit his life to Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior? And to the congregation, as they come to bring this child here today, we are signifying this child is now going to be a part of this congregation here at North KRP Church. And because of that, that means that this child is going to be your responsibility. Because as a child of the covenant community, we are all called to show this child Jesus. And so this question is for all of you. Do you, the members of this congregation, undertake with each parent the covenant responsibility for the Christian nurture of this child? For all who agree will stand in. Thank you. 
Sorry, girls. I'm glad you're ready to get up front. I, I am. <laughs> I invite everyone to stand uh, together. Our second hymn this morning is number 271, Rock of Ages. for me. Let me hide myself in thee. Water and the blood join thy wound inside which flows. Be of sin the double cure. Cleanse me from its guilt and power. Not the labor of my hands fulfill the law's demands seal no respite no my tears forever flow all for sin could not atone thou must save and thou alone nothing in my hands Simply to thy cross I cling, make it come to thee for trance, helpless look to thee for grace, I'll I to the fountain fly, wash me safe. be seated. And now the children can come forward.
when you're drawing, right, that you actually color outside the line. Mm -hmm. And you actually make a mistake and you're probably drawing wrong, right? That's right. And they make a mistake and don't even back on those though. Yet we actually drop something and spill. Because we make mistakes all the time. Let me ask you a question. Did God make mistakes? No. Right? But bad things happen, don't they? Does that mean God made no mistakes? No. So God has a big plan for your life, right? You and I don't make mistakes all day long, right? Whether it be dropping milk, coloring outside the line, making bulletins upside down. Or Drinking and when it means that we don't listen to God when we break his commands. We make mistakes. We sin. But the good news is, is God doesn't make mistakes. Even with all the bad stuff that happens, everything works out just the way he plans it to. Did you know why? Think about Jesus. What happened to Jesus on that cross? He died. Now that would seem like a bad thing, right? But did, was that a good thing for you though? Yes. Why? Why? Why is it? Because he said he said for my sins, right? So even though it might have looked like God might have made a mistake, though Jesus died, nope, that was all part of the plan. He knew exactly what he was doing. Because Jesus died to save us. Now what? What happened three days later? He rose again, right? So God did know what he was doing. And you know, sometimes in our lives, when it looks like maybe God made a mistake, bad things are happening, we can trust that he knows what he's doing. But also, whenever you and I make we can know that God's forgiven us through Jesus, right? And so we trust in forgiveness, and what happens? We forgive. Right? Just like that, it's Jesus done for us. So this week, I just want you to think about that. If you make like any kind of mistake this week, I want you to think about God, how he doesn't make mistakes, but how he also forgives people like us who make mistakes all the time. Okay? And if you want to take the bulletins on your seat, that God so loves us. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day. Lord, we thank you that we make mistakes all the time, but Lord, you still love us. You are still gracious. And Lord, you don't make mistakes. And we see that through Jesus and how he came and died and rose again, all to save us. It was all part of your plan. That reminds us of each and every day that if we're going through good times or bad times, Lord, it's all happening because you planned it that way. And so, Lord, may we be reminded of that as everything's working out for your glory, for our good. And so, Lord, may you just help us, Lord, to live more and more for you. So we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Go on. Go downstairs and feel your seat coming with you. It's amazing how God allows a mistakes to actually work out. <laughs> so, <laughs> it has been a, a long week with sickness in the Bernard house, and uh, but you know what? I'm here this morning, and you're here this morning. So, <laughs> um, We'll continue on in Daniel chapter 8. Uh, we'll be looking at here uh, verses 15 through uh, 27, but before we uh, continue on, just to kind of catch some of you up, uh, we're in the section of Daniel, that's the interesting part. Uh, talking about visions and things of that nature. And last week we saw in chapter 2, uh, excuse me, chapter 7, uh, a vision that God had given Daniel of four beasts of the Ancient of Days, of the Son of Man, and the hope that we as a church have. And this morning here in chapter 8, we find another vision that Daniel records for us. And so here again, something else to speak to us today. But before we continue on, let's go to the Lord for help. Oh, Heavenly Father, we thank you again for your word we thank you that it's a lamp into our feet, a light into our path, and Lord, we pray that you would help us here this morning to understand it. Lord, open our hearts, open our minds by your Spirit to receive it, to understand it, and to see how it applies to us. Lord, help us now in this time to also see your glory in it, to see how wonderful and amazing that you are. Lord, help us to grow closer to you from it. And so, Lord, in this time, may you also be with me and in my brokenness. Lord, may you use me in spite of myself for your glory and for these people's good. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Again, continuing on in Daniel chapter 8, uh, verses 15 through 27. Hear now again God's word. When I, Daniel, had seen the vision, 
I sought to understand it. Behold, there stood before me one having the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of the Uli, and it called, Gabriel, make this man understand the vision. So he came near where I stood, and when he came, I was frightened and fell on my face. But he said to me, Understand, O son of man, that the vision is for the time at the end. And when he had spoken to me, I fell into a deep sleep with my face to the ground, but he touched me and made me stand up. He said, Behold, I will make known to you what shall be at the latter end of the indignation, for it refers to the appointed time of the end. As for the ram that you saw with two horns, these are the kings of Media and Persia. And the goat is the king of Greece, and the great horn between his eyes is the first king. As the horn that was broken, in place of which four others arose, four kingdoms shall arise from his nation, but not with his power. And at the latter end of their kingdom, when the transgressors have reached their limit, a king of bold face, one who understands riddles, shall arise. His power shall be great, but not by his own power. And he should cause fearful destruction and shall succeed in what he does and destroy mighty men and the people who are the saints. By his cunning, he shall make deceit prosper under his hand. And in his own mind, he shall become great. Without warning, he shall destroy many and he shall even rise up against the prince of princes and he shall be broken, but by no human hand. The vision of the evenings and the mornings that has been told is true, but seal up the vision for it first refers to many days from now. And I, Daniel, was overcome and lay sick for some days. Then I rose and went about the king's business, but I was appalled by the vision and did not understand it. The grass withers, the flower fades, but Lord, the Lord endures forever. Amen. Preparation is important. I think we can all agree on that. Being prepared for something uh, always helps, whatever the task might be. Um, you can especially think about school. I remember if I go back to my middle school and high school days, uh, preparation was not my thing. Um, I'm what you would call a procrastinator. And I can't tell you how many times I did not prepare myself to study for that test or to do that project, and it showed in my grades, much to my parents' displeasure. And maybe you can agree with that. <laughs> but thankfully, whenever I went to college, whenever I went to seminary, uh, that changed. I learned my lesson, and so I began to prepare better for, for everything. And thankfully, one of the ways that I found to do that is to simply just ask the professor or the teacher, hey, what is on the exam? Because that's helpful. It's very important. I think we've all been there in school. We go and we ask the teacher, you know, hey, is there anything I need to know for this particular test? Because you've been going through weeks and weeks of learning, and it's a, it makes it easier to kind of whittle it down and know exactly what's going to be on there. So you ask the teacher, all right, what do I need to know to prepare for this test? Now, there might have been some teachers out there. I remember having a couple that says, just study it all. But then there are those, those wonderful, gracious teachers that give you a study guide, right? This is what you need to know for the test. If you take the study guide and use it and study these items, then you, when you take the test, you'll do okay. Because here on the study guide, you have the right information that you need to do well. And I would say that those study guides are my best friend. If you've ever had a study guide in class before, you would probably agree with me. It's a wonderful thing to have. And if you look at our passage here this morning, you can look at this chapter as somewhat of a study guide that God has given to us. And here's why. Because just in like in school, you have many tests. Well, you think about life, life has plenty of tests, doesn't it? It has plenty of trials and difficulties. You have many struggles in your life with evil, with temptation, with sin. And there's many times when it's so difficult that we don't know which way is up, which way is down, like this bulletin over here. And so we wonder, what do we do? How do we go about it? Well, thankfully, God gives us passages like Daniel chapter 8 here to be that study God for us to help prepare us with what we need to know when we're going to go through difficulties and pains and problems in life. Both problems that are outside and inside ourselves. Because here in this passage this morning, God's going to tell us three things in particular in order to prepare us of how we as believers ought to live in this world. How we ought to prepare for what life, what the devil, what sin, and what everything else is thrown at us in order to live a life well as a believer. And so now as we have this study guide in our hand, the first of the three things God wants us to know here 
in order to prepare us, is that he wants us to know that he controls all history. Again, God controls all of history. Now, if you look at this passage, you're saying, well, where does it say that? Daniel doesn't come right out and say that explicitly. But if you actually read this passage, you see that. You see God's governing hand through it all. Look at verses number 1 through 4. In the third year of the reign of King Belshazzar, a vision appeared to me. Daniel, after that which appeared to me at the first. And I saw in the vision, and when I saw, I was in Susa, the citadel, which is in the province of Elam. And I saw in the vision, and I was at the Ulai Canal, and raised my eyes and saw, and behold, a ram standing on the bank of the canal. It had two horns, and both horns were high, but one was higher than the other, and the higher one came up last. I saw the ram charging westward and northward and southward. No beast could stand before him, and there was no one who could rescue from his power. He did as he pleased and became great. Now, Daniel chapter 8 comes two years after Daniel chapter 7, um, after the first vision. So here, Daniel receives this second vision. And in that vision, he is transported to Susa, which is in the land of Elam, which is uh, modern-day Iraq. But this city of Susa is also going to be the chief capital city of the Persian Empire. And so he's transported there. He finds himself in the middle of this canal where two big rivers would come together. And then he looks, and then he sees a ram. That ram has two horns. One horn is higher than the other, and that ram is charging around westward, northward, and southward. Excuse me, and eastward. And we're told that nothing can stand against this ram's power. Now, when you see visions like this, it makes you scratch your head. Okay, what is this saying? But thankfully, Daniel chapter 8 is one of those that actually tells us. If you jump down to verses 20 through 23, one commentator calls it a glossary for us of key terms telling us what these things mean. And so if you jump down towards the end, you find out what it is. So this ram is the Medo-Persian Empire. We talked about that last week with that bear in Daniel chapter 7. Persia being the greater power of the two, being the greater horn of the two. And this empire would charge around, conquering all those around him. And nobody could seem to stand against it. So that's what that ram is. But here's how this ties into showing us God's in control. Because here you see God at work. The reason is, is the book of Daniel is written around 550 B.C., which occurs 10 years before Babylon would fall to the Persian Empire. And what this tells us here is God knows what's going to happen before it happens. And the reason is because he is the one that causes it to happen. He is the one that has set out the plan. And this Persian Empire is going to be dominant for 200 years. But God knew all that, again, because he is the one that caused it to happen. And he is the one that causes what will happen next, which we see in verses 5 through 8. As I was considering, behold, a male goat came from the west across the face of the whole earth without touching the ground. And the goat had a conspicuous horn between his eyes. He came to the ram and with the two horns which I had seen standing on the bank of the canal. And he ran at him in his powerful wrath. I saw him come close to the ram and he was enraged against him and struck the ram and broke his two horns. And the ram had no power to stand before him, but he cast him down to the ground and trampled on him. And there was no one who could rescue the ram from his power. Then the goat became exceedingly great, but when he was strong... The great horn was broken, and instead of it, there came up four conspicuous horns toward the four winds of heaven. So after you see this ram, this goat comes on the scene. And this goat is moving so fast, it's coming all the way across the world. It doesn't, it's not even touching the ground, it's moving so fast. So it speeds in and absolutely demolishes this ram. And then we're told that this goat would become very great. It's got this little horn in the middle of its head. But just as it is becoming great, that little horn breaks, and it's replaced by four other little horns. And thankfully, again, we're told what this means in verses 20 through 23. They tell us what's going on. This goat is the Greek empire. And that little horn is Alexander the Great. Not to be confused with the little horn that we talked about the Antichrist last week. This is Alexander the Great. That leopard we talked about last week, too. And if we think about history, his conquest was swift. Just like a goat coming out of nowhere, not touching the ground, he had a very swift conquest of all of the empire. It would be swift, far-reaching, but, and yet, when everything was going well, was he, when he was there at the top of his power, tragedy happens. Alexander the Great dies at the age of 33, just like this little horn is then broken. 
And then his kingdom is divided into four kingdoms, these four other little horns that pop up. Uh, the kingdom of the Ptolemies in Egypt, the Seleucid Empire of the East, the kingdom of Pergamum in Asia Minor, and the kingdom of Macedon. But again, I'm not just telling you this is a history lesson. What you need to understand here is, again, this is happening before, is being foretold before it happens. Because Alexander the Great dies in 323 B.C. You remember what I said, the book of Daniel was written in 550 B.C. Over 200 years after this vision is given do these things happen. Why do you think that is? Now many people would say, well, the book of Daniel had to be written later after these things happened because nobody can tell the future. But if you actually look at the original language, it doesn't line up with that time. It lines up with the time of 550, how people wrote then. So why in the world is this talked about here? Is this all just a coincidence? Just happenstance? No, not at all. And that is because, as Daniel has told us over and over again throughout the entire book, it's because God is in charge of history. All the ups, all the downs, they are all guided and directed by his hand. From the rising to the falling of empires to the everyday situations that all of us face, it is all guided by the hand of God. And that should be encouraging for us. Because there are many times in our lives when we feel like our life is out of control. With sickness, with death, with relationship problems, with finances, with our jobs, with schools, with just simply the world we live in. It seems like it's all falling apart. But this passage reminds us of the truth. Again, God gives it to us as a study, God, to prepare us. That when life seems chaotic and wild and doesn't seem like it's making any sense, it reminds us that God is over all of history. That he is in control over it all. He is guiding it by his hand even if we can't see how and why he's doing it. He knows what's going to happen today, tomorrow, and just like in this passage 200 years from now. And even though we might not know what might happen next, we can find comfort in knowing that even when it seems like we've lost control, knowing that God has not. But God also wants us to prepare for a couple other things as well. Not only does he want us to know that he's in control of history, the second thing God wants us to know to prepare us is that as believers, we are going to face hardship. It is going to happen as much as we wish it does not. The Christian life is not one of sunshine and roses. It's not easy and perfect. There are many hardships that all of us are going to have to face, whether it comes in the form of temptation of depravity and just the simple fallen world we live in, or it becomes by the hand of very wicked and evil people. And here in this passage, we see the hardship coming from one such terrible person. Look at verses 9 through 12. We're told that out of one of those four little horns that popped up came a little horn, which grew exceedingly great towards the south, toward the east, and toward the glorious land. It grew great even to the host of heaven. And some of the host and some of the stars it threw down to the ground and trampled on them. It became great, even as great as the prince of the host. And the regular burnt offerings were taken away from him. And the place of his sanctuary was overthrown. And a host will be given over to it together with a regular burnt offering because of transgression. And it will throw truth to the ground and it will act and prosper. What we're told here is a little horn is going to sprout out of one of these four kingdoms. And this little horn is going to go great in power. Because verse 24 will tell us that this power is not his own, not in the sense of he had his own strength to take over, but no, he used scheming. Um, he used being deceptive. You, again, you jump down to verse 24, it talks about uh, understanding riddles. That's an idea of this person is, is very wise and crafty. Uh, he is going to weasel his way to the top. And when he gets there, he's going to cause much destruction and devastation. And he's going to be so arrogant that he's going to think himself to be just as great as God is. And this person has a name. And no, this is not talking about the Antichrist here. Because if you look at history, this is all something that God, God foretold. Because there was a man named Antiochus Epiphanes IV who reigned from the year 175 to 164 B.C. Now this man was a king of one of those four empires, the Seleucid Empire in the east after the Alexander the Kingdom's, uh, excuse me, the Great's Kingdom broke up. So he was a king of this empire, and he was an arrogant man. The very name Epiphanes was a nickname saying, God made manifest. 
although that nickname could also be called Madman, which many people called him. He was an evil, arrogant, proud man who wormed his way to the top by seizing his throne from his nephew. He was a man who sought to then enforce his rule upon all of his subjects by making them and forcing them to adopt Greek culture and Greek religious practices. And if you look at verse 11, it sounds off, but that's what happened. This is showing what he's going to do. It talks about the burnt offerings there. Well, he's going to take away the burnt offerings. Again, in those days, that was a part of temple worship. And so he's going to come and he's going to say, cut that out. He's he's going to throw out part of God's worship. He's going to eventually outlaw sacrifices themselves to God in the year 167 B.C. He's going to also ban circumcision, again, the sign of God's covenant to his people. And he's going to ban Sabbath practices, practices. And if you break these things you'll face the death penalty. All your sacrifices were instead to be made to the pagan gods, to his gods. And he even got to the point where Antiochus would then go to the temple in Jerusalem. He would overthrow God's sanctuary, it says here, and he would erect a statue of the Greek god Zeus in the middle of it and slaughter pigs on the altar. And if you know anything about the Bible, pigs were unclean animals. And he did that intentionally to defile the sanctuary of God. He also cast God's truth to the ground by burning the scriptures. And he would slaughter those who remained true to God. And he would send out overseers to different areas to make sure everybody was was listening. And if they weren't, then they would force them to do it. And if those people would find people that had circumcised their children or that who had copies of the Torah of the Bible that day, then those people would be put to death. And that's why we see here verse 24, this is a person who would seek to destroy mighty men and the people who are the saints. As one commentator says, this isn't talking about the Antichrist, but we see God foretelling a little taste of what the Antichrist is like. A man seeking to be just as great as God is, trying to reach up in heaven and cast down the Prince of Hosts. But if you look at history, he's not the only person who acts like this. This might be talking about him in particular, but we can also see many people in history that have acted like this. We think about people like Hitler, Saddam Hussein, Genghis Khan, many of the Roman emperors, and many, many more you could name out there. We have seen people commit horrendous atrocities. And we've seen the people of God being made subject to all of their evil, to all of their wickedness. And honestly, even in the world today, we can see it. Obviously, we can see it in other countries where people are being put to death for their faith. But even in the world we live in today, maybe a little more subtly, but we can see people being ostracized for believing what we believe. We see the culture trying to force the way it thinks we should worship on us, if what, the way it thinks what we should believe on us, rather than what God has to say in his word, no matter how culturally appropriate it might seem. The truth is, is that we're going to have to face hardships like that. Whether it comes in the form of wicked rulers or corrupt governments or culture pushing, it's going to be forced upon us. We're going to be having to face that. But that's not the only area we might have to face hardship. It can also come from just the, the fallenness of the world, the depravity of the world, if you think about it. How many of you have seen sickness? How many of you have you seen death? Those are hardships, are they not? Whether it's ourselves or those around us. Or maybe it's from overwhelming financial burdens that you're having to go through. Where your job just won't pay the bills. Or whether it's your your children are being rebellious. Whether they're toddlers. I know all about that. Whether they're teenagers. Or whether either even adults who have walked away from the faith. That's a struggle, right? You name it. We all have struggles in different ways. Or it might even be coming from inside you. The devil might be tempting you. And you might be struggling to fight against those temptations in your lives. It might be an addiction to drugs, to alcohol, to pornography. It might be a struggle with pride, with humility, with patience, with anger. We all know that struggle in some way. And it's hard when we're going through it, isn't it? But that shouldn't surprise us. That's why God tells us here, you're going to face hardship. And 1 John 5... 19, we're told that. He says, we know that we are from God 
And the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. We live in a fallen, broken world. And here God is trying to tell us and preparing us, look, there are going to be times when we are going to suffer. Times when we're going to ask the question, as verse 13 here says, For how long? How long is the vision concerning the regular burnt offering, the transgression that makes desolate, and the giving over of the sanctuary and host be, to be trampled underfoot? How long is this going to happen, God? How many of you have been there in your life with you're going through something, a hardship, a difficulty, and you're asking God, how long do I have to go through this? How long does this person I know I love have to go through this? And we wonder, is it ever going to end? But we find, again, hope in this passage. Because although we might feel like those struggles, those trials, those testing, they're never going to end, there's one more thing that God wants to tell us here in order to prepare us as believers. And that is this. He, he wants us to know that your deliverance will indeed come. See, right after that question of how long in verse 13, he tells us in verse 14, for 2,300 evenings and mornings, then the sanctuary shall be restored to its rightful state. Now, I'm going to tell you, I can't tell you what the 2,300 mornings and evenings are. Um, some say it might mean 6.3 years, or if you divide it in half, thinking morning and evening, okay, 3.15 years, but we can't know exactly. But what we can know from this is that there is going to be a determined end to the people's suffering. It's going to be over. Antiochus is not going to reign forever. Because if you actually look at history, we see that. We see faithful Jews, they will rebel. They will be led by the Maccabees. They would drive out those Seleucids out of Judah. And then they would cleanse and rededicate the temple in 164 B.C., what we consider Hanukkah. And then Antiochus himself would also die in 164. Verse 25 telling us this, that he would rise up against the prince of princes, against God himself. And what's going to happen? He shall be broken but by no human hand. Just as that ram would fall, just as that goat would fall, this little horn is going to fall too, not by any human hand, but by the hand of God who holds history in his hands. And the same is true with whatever suffering you're going through right now. This reminds you that it is not going to last forever. It might end today, next week, two years from now, or it might not end until the end of your life. But in the end, it will be done. It will be over. You see, that's why you see in this passage here, when it talks about the end, uh, in verse number 19, for it refers to the appointed time of the end. That's not talking about the end times, the second coming of Jesus. It's talking about the, the end of this persecution by Antiochus. God has appointed the time of the end. It's going to stop whenever God says it's going to stop. But he wants us to know that it is going to stop. That suffering from this madman, as well as whatever suffering you might be going through today, this tells us it is going to come to an end. Oh, what a wonderful thing that is, to know we're not going to suffer forever. And that'll be, that'll be great if you know, it ends tomorrow, right? But even at the end of our, if it doesn't stop until the end of our life, we can still find hope. Because, again, we, we see the gospel in this passage. You can see the gospel in every part of the Bible, including this. Because when you think about Jesus, what he's done for us, you know, we, we see the brokenness of the world. We think about the power of Satan, the temptation in our lives. And we're in the middle of facing problems. It might feel like those things may never end, but we're reminded here they will. Because the prince of princes, the king of kings, he's come. If you go to the book of Mark, chapter 3, verse 27, Jesus says, He has come and he has bound the strong man. And he has plundered his goods. Jesus Christ has come into the world and he has bound the devil. He has defeated sin and death so that you and I would be delivered. And we know that Jesus doesn't do this by any normal means, like with the sword, but by giving his life as a ransom for his people. By standing in our place, taking on our penalty where we deserve it. And we can know that if we put our trust in the Lord Jesus Christ, that no matter what we have done, no matter how far gone we might think we'd be, if we have trusted in him, you can know that he has delivered you. No matter what struggle is going on in your life right now. And when you know that, when you know that you have been delivered by Jesus, it gives you hope. 
wherever you might be. Because you can know that in the end, it is not, that is going to be your true destination. That makes me think of the new, new vehicle I got in the last year. Um, it has a TV screen in it. And part of the reason why we got that is so on long road trips with the kids, they'll have something to watch. But one neat little feature, uh, your car might have it, is on there, there there's this app that says uh, how much longer or something or like that. And the whole reason is, is how many of you have had a kid in your car ask you, are we there yet? You tell them, well, so-and-so, this, this amount. Then a little while later, are we there yet? Are we there yet? And they keep asking you over and over and over again. And I'm pretty sure there was a person that made this, this app in this car wanted a solution to that problem. <laughs> because on it, what you can do is on that screen, you can put it on there. And it'll tell your children how, how much farther we have to go, the distance it takes. Now, it doesn't tell you the exact time you'll get there because you might have to run into traffic. You might have to stop for a potty break or, or, or sightsee or whatever it might be. But it will tell you how, long, how much longer as far as length goes to that destination. Showing the kids, okay, here the numbers are ticking down. We're going to get there. We might not know the time, but we will get there. As each time they look up, you're closer to the destination. And as you look at this passage, that's what this is telling us. Because sometimes we wonder, are we ever going to get there? Sometimes we wonder, is this problem, this pain, whatever it is, ever going to be over? But these verses remind us that we will get there. Even if it seems like we're going nowhere. Even if the problems, even if the pains keep continuing to get worse. There is a countdown to our deliverance that we have in Jesus Christ. A countdown to deliverance of whenever this life crisis will be over. Or when everything will be over and we will experience the full deliverance of Jesus Christ face to face. We can know it will happen. And therefore, that prepares us properly. You see, all these things here in the vision are designed to prepare us just for that. To remind us God is in control. Yes, we're going to face hardship, but we're also going to expect deliverance. And life is much better when you know what's coming. There's a commentator, Ralph Davis, explains it so well from his own personal story. He talks about how um, in his house, uh, he was walking down the hall, and his wife jumps out at him from their guest bedroom and scares him half to death. Now, I remember uh, myself, Amanda, doing that to me, and I promise you I've never hit my wife, but that day I almost did out of reflex because I was not expecting it. But the situation is much different when you know the person is hiding there, don't you? Whether you see your wife as you walk around this thing, duck behind a wall or into a room, but they don't see you, but you know that they're there, so then you can have a little fun with it, right? The whole situation changed. You can walk down that hall, walk beside that room, they jump out, say boo, and you can just look at them with just a plain face, taking away the pleasure that they have. Or you can do what I like to do, walk down there and then jump out at them instead, and you get the laugh, and they get scared to death. But the fact is that when you know what awaits you, it makes all the difference in the end. And that's exactly what we see here in Daniel chapter 8. Just like this good study guide trying to prepare you for a test, this passage is designed to prepare us for whatever might come our way. So if we know what's coming, we can do as John 16, 1 says, and keep from falling away. Hold fast to the faith. So if we know what's coming, that whatever hardship it is that you might face, whether it be a wicked ruler, a depraved world, your own sin and temptation, you can know that it is not going to last forever. Because you have a God that's in control. You have a God that has delivered you before, a God who will deliver you now, and a God who will deliver you in the very end. And because you can know that ahead of time, we are prepared to stand fast in our faith, living for God, because he has given us passages like this to remind us the hope that we can always have no matter what might come our way. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you again that you love us. We thank you that you care for us, and we thank you that you've given us a hope that we find in Jesus Christ, that no matter what may come our way, we can know that we have found deliverance in you. And so Lord, I pray that for all of us here today, you would remind us that our struggles, our pains, our difficulties will not last forever because we have the hope that you are in control, that you have saved us, that you will deliver us, and that nothing can take that away. 
And so, Lord, here this morning, Lord, may you offer us that encouragement. May you offer us that peace, that strength to continue to move through whatever it is that we're facing. Because we know that you are the mighty God that's over it all. And although the suffering might not seem like it ever will end, you remind us that it will. And you remind us of the deliverance that we have in you. And so, Lord, may you give us encouragement here today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. If I everyone to stand together, our final hymn this morning is number 369. How firm a foundation, and we'll be singing the second tune. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say? See now the benediction of the Lord. Lord bless you and keep you. Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen and amen. May the peace.